Hi. Hey, how are you, Linda? I'm good. How are you? I am doing great. I'm really honored to be on your show. And last time I saw you face to face was Roots Tech London, and uh, conferences now are more like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, my name is Linda Quist, and I try to do these uh, live chats every week. I have been doing some in Swedish the last couple of weeks, and now we're back doing them in English. So my guest today is David Allen Lambert, and as he said, we met in uh, London at Rhodes Tech. But I've heard you on, uh, for example, the podcast Extreme Jeans, where you are uh, every week, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, they haven't found a reason to kick me off the show yet. So <laughs> the, uh, I give them enough entertainment with my family history news, and uh, Scott Fisher, who is the, obviously the main host, uh, has got some really good. Uh, chemistry with me and he calls me his brother from another mother <laughs> okay yes yeah. so i think most people watching are into genealogy and family history research and the question we always want to ask is where are you and where did your ancestors come from oh my goodness well obviously <laughs> um i live uh, in massachusetts i live in a town called stoughton uh, which was ironically named for the man who was the judge of the Salem witchcraft trials. So not exactly a popular person during the Halloween uh, time frame. I work in Boston. Um, I am the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and American Ancestors. We're the oldest genealogical society in the world, actually, and uh, started back 175 years ago in 1845. Uh, my ancestors range a variety of different places. Um, each one of my grandparents were born in a different country, technically. So my um, mother's father is from England. He came from Nantwich, England. He came over to uh, Canada in 1911. My mother's mother is from an old New England line that came over first from uh, Bedfordshire, England in 1629. So I'm not a Mayflower descendant, but close enough to that decade. <laughs> Um, my dad's family is uh, a mix because I have both uh, German, Irish, English, Montbelliard, which uh, is a uh, area right near the French, the France and Swiss border. Uh, so I have people on that on my tree. Um, but for the most part, I'm English and Irish. However, uh, I have done Swedish genealogy because my wife's great great grandmother came from Boros, Sweden. So uh, I, I've Read about the outflings and the outflings <laughs> in the inoculations of her ancestors, which I think is a great record set. But for genealogy, I'm intrigued with all of my ancestors, and I, I still have some brick walls after doing this since I was seven years old. Oh, you started when you were seven? That, yeah. that was uh, 40, almost 44 years ago. There was no internet then, and uh, the idea that uh, a kid would be interested in genealogy was kind of uh, unique. In fact, I went to where I worked back in the um, early 1980s, and they said, well, you need a parent or guardian. And I said, but they're not interested in genealogy. I am. <laughs> and now I've been there longer than anyone after being there for 27 years. Uh, so I guess I got the last laugh on that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I'm still looking at genealogy. I mean, I think that with DNA and with everything that goes on with the Internet and new databases, and being able to find cousins um, through autosomal DNA, it's a never-ending process. I mean, I, what I, I think the biggest thrill now is when I connect with a cousin who has a photograph or a story or another angle of a story that's been passed down. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, it, it's kind of changed with DNA because before we often look backwards and now we find people that we are related to, but we need to find where we, we connect. But it's, it's living people. Mm -hmm. And I often might have a, a photo of a relative that we never seen before. It's true. It's true. And I, I think what's interesting is that I've been connecting with people in England uh, from my uh, maternal grandfather's side that really didn't even know any further back than, say, the 1800s. And I've been able to do stateside here in America research because in some cases we were in the same parish since the time of Henry VIII in the 1530s and 40s. And I'm like, well, here's your genealogy. I'm talking to myself, you live five miles from where your family lived 400 years ago, and I'm telling you more, and I live 4,000 miles away, you know? So it's fun. I, I, and it really expands upon um, my own genealogy knowledge because 
these are people that can tell me stories in the 1800s, early 20th century where maybe the records aren't accessible yet, but they can tell me that because it's part of their, you know, that was, that was their grandparents, their parents or great grandparents. So it's fun. I love reconnecting with people. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I was uh, thinking, uh, we have a lot of relatives here in Sweden that uh, emigrated to the U S in the 1860s until like 1920s. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Swedish people are trying to find where did my immigrants, immigrants end up or where did they go? What mm -hmm. did they do? And I think we look a lot of, lot of time into the census records, but what are the other records that we, we shouldn't miss, miss well, out sure. on? Sure, um, I mean, it depends where they're living, Linda. I mean, so if they're living in a small town, Obviously, uh, you're not going to get a city directory. You might get a town directory, um, which is essentially um, when people had to pay a tax, they had a poll tax they had to pay. So until women got the right to vote a century ago in 1920, it would generally be the head of household or the male, or the males in the household who were voting. Um, you would get the address of the person, their occupation, and um, obviously sometimes it even tells you where they were the year before. Um, some cases it even tells you where the person was born, uh, depending on the type of list. But for city directories, if your person's living in an urban area, of course, with um, patronymic names, uh, they, they kind of stop once you come across to America. So you don't have to worry about that generational change, which is the headache that I faced. I said, there can't be a guild of one name studies in Sweden. I can't. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, so I... Uh, I, I find that it's, it's, you know, for my wife's Anderson family, I mean, finding that he was a soldat in the census in uh, Boros, and when he came over to America, he became a night watchman. So he already had that idea of knowing how to be a guard, probably had a gun and all that. So that's what he did. And I was able to follow him in both the town directories, the censuses, and then, of course, vital records. And depending on what part of America you're dealing with, there are sometimes vital records uh, that are accessible well into the 20th century. So you can find the births, marriages, and deaths. And every state has a um, generally a statewide index by the 20th century or late 19th, if they're keeping the record. So it makes it easier to find people. Uh, you don't have to know specifically a town. In the case that maybe you have a relative who went to America and last thing you knew they were living in Vermont. You can look at Vermont vital records right down to the 1980s and sometimes even later um, and maybe find the family without even having to leave your laptop computer in Sweden. So. <laughs> nice. Here, here in Sweden, we do a lot of research of um, when we find people, uh, we keep very good track of birth date. But then when we come to the U.S. and we look in, in the census, there is like, perhaps an age or perhaps born in 1860. And that is uh, so different from Sweden where we really keep track of the, of the birthday. So, so that, that's something that we have to adjust to. And perhaps we don't realize that when we start looking into the US records and think, why don't you keep track, with, track of the birth dates? Right, in fact, that's true. The 1900 census is the only census in the United States that actually, uh, that's accessible now, that it only asks you the month and year you were born. Um, the Canadian censuses um, starting in 1901 actually asked you for a full birth date. So if you're lucky enough that your ancestors came from Sweden to Canada, you're gonna get that full date. And then it's almost like a, uh, an aha moment because you know it's the right person. Of course, the other thing you have to keep in mind with the census is that somebody knocks on the door and they're not, they don't know English. So they're conveying as best as they can their age. And the enumerator who does not know Swedish is probably interpreting what he, he might think they're saying and write down, they look like they're 30 when they're technically 43 and they're just really look good for their age. Uh, or they may not know. I found the best uh, census I ever saw um, was one for Vermont. I think it was either about 1900 or 1910. And it was an Italian lady. Uh, it was in her 80s. And they they wrote on, they were the age and place of birth. They assumed she was born in Italy. They wrote her age. She goes, God only knows. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so, I mean, it's, it does make it difficult. I mean, the one thing that's useful is that um, once somebody came over here after 1934 with Social Security, you're going to have to record your uh, date of birth and place of birth. So in the Social Security uh, abstracts or if they were in um, one great place to, to find the matches for your males from Sweden, if you find them in the World War One draft registrations in America, that's an exact date of birth. And oftentimes, depending on the um, the form, and actually they put exactly where they were born. So you get the village in Sweden, uh, not just Sweden, which you'll get in the census. And so that's one other clue that comes up that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, and other thing I was uh, thinking about was, uh, yeah, you, you, you have done a lot of research for, for military records as well. Mm. There are, and that's one of the things that's really, um, for me, genealogy is more than just names and dates. I mean, when I take my kids to see my parents, my parents died by the time I was 30. And my oldest daughter is 24, was just a, a toddler at the time when my dad died. And I say, you know, what's important is the dash on the gravestone between the birth year and the death year. That's that's the life, the dash. And that's where you start telling the stories to people. And as genealogists, um, we have the... Uh, capability that we're going to have um, all of this great record resources available. Sorry, my computer just went to sleep for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, why is it on blank? Um, so with military records, it fills in that gap. So um, we're very lucky that if you have an ancestor who was in, say, World War One, World War Two, some of the records were destroyed, uh, depending on the branch of the service. The U.S. Army records are gone. Um, but if they were in the Navy, you can go to the National Archives in Washington and look at the logbook and know the longitude and latitude of the ship, know where every place they went. So in a way, it builds a diary, if you will, a day-by-day -day diary, which your ancestor did. And military records are good in uh, America back to the 1600s. So we can find some really treasure troves. Uh, the earlier military records are a little tough because if your ancestor's name was John Johnson, well, do you have the right John Johnson in the Revolutionary War, or is it uh, this other John Johnson? Can, and especially in they live in a larger area like Boston, for instance, it's narrowing down. You get the right one, and a lot of these older military lists are just muster rolls. They just say John Johnson marched for seven days and served in this company. That's where you kind of have to do that fan approach that we do, the family associates and neighbors, and looking at other people in the military list. I call it adopting the regiment or the vessel and finding out who the people that are with him in that list, are they from the same town? Do one of them get a pension record years later and your ancestor writes a, uh, a letter or an affidavit, if you will, that says, I was there at the battle and I saw your ancestor get injured. And in the same token, you want to then look at that person's pension uh, and see if they're writing a letter in uh, support of your ancestors. So you can get, maybe get a different insight from a different person writing in support. So pension records are great if you can find those from the Revolutionary War straight on down through the Spanish-American War and sometimes a little later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and talking about the Spanish-American War, I had the first emigrant I found because I was always told that we had no people going to the to to America, and it took me like three months of doing my genealogy research, and I found the first one, oh, and I was so happy. I bet and you were. Uh, yeah, and I noticed that he uh, he was a volunteer in the Spanish uh, Spanish American War, and. At the time, I didn't know much about that war. I, I, I don't even think I know it had happened. But when I found him, I had to 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 read about it. And he was in his forties. And when I went, when I looked at the people who was volunteering, they were more much younger, like in their twenties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, most of the time you see it, they're about eighteen to thirty-five years old, or eighteen to thirty, or even sometimes younger. Uh, but 40, that's that's good. What state did he enlist from? Do you recall? Yeah, yeah, he was in uh, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. And, and he was in the uh, Company K of the uh, 4th Regiment. So I, I found his uh, master role. And I had no idea that he was in this war. And uh, it doesn't seem that he 
was in the way he was just walking and and then when they had walked a long time the the war had ended so yeah the um the Spanish didn't bad to learn one thing yeah the spanish american war is really you get 1898 i mean it's a war that lasted four months so a lot of guys that were in the service at that point in time stayed in because immediately after um the spanish american war we enter into the philippine insurrection and that lasted until 1902. in fact i remember back when I was still in high school, I wrote to a man named Nathan uh, Butler, who lived in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He was the last veteran of the Philippine insurrection. He was in the US Navy in 1900. And he was like a 16 year old Navy veteran. And I was like blown away because here's a guy who was in the military 87, almost 90 years ago. Yeah. So that's great. Um, have, did he have a pension file by any chance? Yeah, I, I found the index card for the pension, for, for the pension, but I haven't found anything more because I don't really know where to look for that. Well, you're in luck because I will <laughs> give you a favor. When the National Archives in Washington, D.C. opens back up and I am down in D.C., I will go and I will take my handy dandy cell phone and I will digitize in color his entire pension file for you. That is one thing I would love to do because oh, I'm sure you awesome. can return the favor in Sweden because chances yeah. I won't be there anytime soon. <laughs> I, I would be happy to do that. Yeah, so, that, yeah, yeah that, that's great. He was a soldier in Sweden. So I guess that's why he, he got into this and he was a corporal as well. So mm -hmm. it seems. Now, did he come back home or did he stay or what, what was the story after the war? Do you know what happened to him? Or? Yeah, he, he moved to Minnesota. There were four siblings that emigrated and all, they all ended up in, in Minnesota, but he never got married and he didn't, didn't have any children as I know of. And uh, well, you'll it find was, out the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. And uh, it was a newspaper article where it said he, he was found dead in his cabin, probably oh. by natural causes, but uh, it was like a veteran fo found dead in, uh, in his cabin in 1928. And it also says that uh, his brother got there in time for the funeral. So, well, I'm sure there's probably uh, forms he had to fill out about when he came into the country. There are going to be forms that are going to tell you what he did for work. If he had a reason for a pension, they would explain the medical reasons. So you'll probably find more medical knowledge and you probably want to know about him. <laughs> but um, it's it's really fascinating because the pensions really kind of give it, like I say, it, it gives you it's like a diary of the person's life. So from the time they applied to the time that they died, and I'll have all the places that he lived, et cetera. It's, it's some really great material. So I would be delighted to get that for you. Hopefully next year, uh, we'll be going back to Washington, D.C. Uh, for a trip that my work in EHGS does every other year. Yes, that sounds great because he is also one person that I don't have a photo of. So getting as much information about him. And, and he since he was the first immigrant I found, he's so special to me. Oh, I bet. I bet. Well, then you'll have to. Now, do you know where he's buried? Did he ever have a gift from a gravestone? Yeah. No, yeah. Actually, when we we were in Minnesota for a family reunion, and my first wish was to go to the cemetery, and oh. there is no stone, uh, because uh, for for some reason there there is only a marker, and I was in contact with the museum in in the same little town. And they had uh, a map, so they wrote out on, on the map where his uh, marker was. So I think we found the right marker. And I think there was a, a small, uh, a small star, at the like for as he was a veteran. Interesting. The, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, so the uh, the government will give a free gravestone for any veteran who was honorably discharged, and since he got a pension, he was honor considered honorably discharged. So if he doesn't have a an upright military stone with his name and Spanish American war. I can work with you and help you get that for free from the United States government. They will provide a real gravestone for him. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and you, you talked about the, this uh, old uh, society founded in uh, 1845. What, uh, tell us more about that. Well, we are um, really one of the, places that for genealogy were kind of become one-stop shopping. Uh, so if you have ancestors that arrived in 1620, or if you have ancestors that arrived 20 years ago, 
what our team will do. We're an eight story research facility. In fact, we're expanding. We bought the building next door and we're gonna have a discovery center and uh, a whole different experience versus your contemporary library. We're gonna offer people um, chances to come in and you know use a computer to kind of get started. And if they wanna come up and use the library, they can. We have over a quarter of a million books. Um, we have 28 million manuscripts uh, ranging for every ethnic group uh, that you can imagine between our publications, our microfilms, our databases. We have subscription databases to all the major um, sites like Ancestry and uh, Find My Past and My Heritage. So you don't need an account. You can come and use that while you're visiting the library. Um, the nice thing is that you're, you're not like with just a website where you kind of plug in a name and a date. With uh, American Ancestors, we have a website with over a billion searchable records, but we also have a physical bricks and mortar library, our research institution. You can go in, you can sit down and talk to someone. And if it's in depth, we can even sign you up for, you know, half hour, hour or all day consultation. So you can work one on one with a genealogist. Um, but you can come right up to the reference desk and ask a question and we'll help you uh, navigate it. it. And it's is more is as complex as a question be, might be, or as basic as it we are, we're always there to help. In fact, what we're doing as we work from home, as I'm here in my uh, spare bedroom, my home office, we're still doing uh, chats. We're doing uh, a live chat 3 to 4 p.m. every east, every day, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. You can go right through AmericanAncestors.org and ask us a question. Uh, we also have the... Uh, way that as a member, you can contact us through Ask a Genealogist and send us an email. And we answer reference questions. I probably did about six of them today. Um, so it's really, um, it, it's an amazing organization um, because we try to serve every um, person, no matter when their ancestor came over or where they came over from, or even if your ancestor never set foot in New England and your ancestor went out to Minnesota, we can help you kind of navigate the records. And if we don't have them, we'll help you find where they are. So after 175 years, I've been honored to spend 27 years of my life there. And I hope to spend another 20 plus years working on there because I really believe in what they do at American Ancestors. That that's, uh, sounds really awesome, like an awesome job and an awesome place to work at as well. It is. You'll have to come in and see our library sometime. I will. I will write that on my list next time in the U.S. So. Okay. <laughs> so we get some comments from people saying hello. We get one from Sven Junga Thomas, and we get Osa from Helsingborg, and we get... Marita and we got Maria from Stockholm and I think I saw Kevin and he he's, he is in the US I know so if you have any questions please write them in the comments and and we will try to answer them so what is the most common mistake you think people make when they start doing genealogy Ah, uh, well, the most common mistake is that people believe that um, when they, if their ancestors came to America through Ellis Island, that they changed their name at Ellis Island. Uh, nobody at Ellis Island changed their name. <laughs> well, we uh, hear that a lot. That decision a long time uh, before they arrived at Ellis. Um, sometimes they did it on the boat and then changed it after the fact. But whatever your name was on the manifest when you came over was the name that the uh, immigration officer would have recorded in. Uh, I have a friend whose family uh, came over from Eastern Europe in a very long name. I don't recall what it is right now, um, but they took a book of American presidents and they ran their finger down and they stopped at Franklin Pierce, one of our presidents, and that's what their last name is, Pierce. But they didn't use that name till after they had been in America for a while. And then they got, you know, they just wanted to sever their surname from the old country, which is really a, sh a shame. Um, when I'd say the other common mistake, uh, people believe that um, the census is always exact. As we say with the ages, you can look at a census in 1900, 1910, 1930, 1940, and look at the ages of people that they always do not follow the 10 years later, they're exactly 10 years older. I've seen censuses where 10 years later, they're 10 years younger and they've never aged a year. Uh, I'd like to know what that magic trick is. So um, 
don't and the other thing is don't assume what you find online is you know exact i mean a lot of online trees one of the problems is that people will key in the information have just started doing genealogy but they've never looked at an original record to back that up it's like a hypothesis their idea of when somebody was born so the one thing as a genealogist you want to be a detective you always want to reach out in question i don't care if it's a book that was published if it doesn't have a citation and you're not looking at the original record, be suspicious of it uh, because that's where the detective part comes in. Because you might find that somebody has put down your entire lineage on an online tree and you know from your research because you've done it for 5, 10, 20 years, that isn't right. And it compounds. So the, in, in the Internet may be a blessing on one side, but can also be a, a headache on the other because it's giving misinformation that hasn't been vetted or checked. So um, don't ever take for granted what you see online. Question everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, one thing that's happening in a couple of years is the US Census 1950, right? That's very true. That's very, I won't be on that one. I'm not that old yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have to wait till the 1970 census comes up. <laughs> I would be a baby then. Um, yeah, that that would be great to uh, to see that. I mean, obviously, I know that um, Ancestry and Family Search and other companies will probably be racing to get them all indexed. Um, so, the sad thing that I've noticed with the census is, uh, if you look at say the 1900, the 1910, and the 1920 U.S. census you're really at the best part of questions being asked by the time you get to 1940 you don't get as many questions answered as you say did in 1900 1910 and the extra questions if you will are only asked uh to about two people out of 40 on the column if i believe correctly uh so in the 1940 census when i would have hoped that my grandmother or grandfather got the extra questions my mother's seven-year-old sister got the extra questions and it's like well that's not going to be any good so it was not random it was like where you fell on the manifest and it's like really uh so that that can be a little frustrating uh i'm really hoping to find the 1950 i know where all my family is living but one elusive grandfather who is here there and everywhere at that point in time um so i should find my mother i should, should find my father uh my uh my grandparents are all living and uh, so that should be fun. Yeah, because that, that is something when now when we do uh, uh, a lot of DNA, we try to find work a way back. And if they if their match don't have a tree, we try we will we try to build their tree and see. And and it's it's kind of hard to to find information about living people in the U.S. You have to go back to to the 1940s to to kind of know that it's it's the right person. That's true. And that's why the city directories, like Ed said earlier, uh, if you can find somebody in a city directory, many of those are online on Ancestry.com or Family Search has some digitized, where you might have them in 1940, then you can look for that city or urban area and see if there's a directory that goes the next uh, year and the year following. And if you don't find it online, one of the things that I do is I will contact the library for the town and say, listen, what do you have for a list of residents, voter lists, poll tax lists that have the listing of your residents? That way you can look at them and they're published right on down to you know the present day. So I had one town, uh, this is before the internet, it was up in New Hampshire. And all we had was the 1920 census at that point in time. And the public librarian went through all the poll tax lists from 1921 to 1946 when the person died and said he appears on this address photocopied all the pages and i you know i paid a you know a quarter 25 cents per page but i had all that information and there was no internet back then so you can still reach out to librarians in fact even with covid some of them are working remotely within the libraries and they they may actually love a good reference question <laughs> So we actually got a couple of questions here. Are you ready to answer a couple? Sure. So I'll, I'll put them in here so we can see them. We have from Osa. I have an ancestor that 
uh, taught to leave Sweden in 1872 with wife and kid, but the wife and kid stayed in Sweden all her life in the Swedish short records. It says that her husband was in America. I can't find him. Do you have any secret source to recommend? <laughs> well, the first thing I would do is I would look at the 1880 census, which FamilySearch.org has online. Um, obviously, if he has a very common name, like you know John Johnson or something like that, you're going to it would help to know what part of America he went to. If you even have a rumor that he went to California and he went to New York to kind of narrow down that focus. The other thing that you would look at in that census, nothing should be American about him prior to 1872. So if you find that John Johnson, for instance, in Minnesota, that you think that's the state he came went to, he shouldn't have children born in his household in the 1860s. He shouldn't have a wife that is that he's been married to for 10 years, because that would be before 1872. So kind of remember the the stopping point that you know is 1872. Passenger lists are on Ancestry.com and some of them on Family Search. You may find him coming over on a passenger list arriving in 18. 72 from sweden now a lot of times if memory serves me correct people are not obviously coming over directly from sweden they're going to go to england and take a boat from southampton or bristol or elsewhere and they're going to come over on a second boat and that could be where he's arriving from um you might want to check the 1900 census as i said to linda earlier is that um it says the month and year of birth. So you already may know his month and year of birth from the Swedish church records. And if he's truthful in his answer, you may be able to find him that way if he lived that next batch of years. Unfortunately, the 1890 census burned for the majority of the United States. So there really isn't any 1890 census of any great magnitude to check. It's only little bits and pieces, different places that survived. So that would be my, that would be my, magic uh to, to try first at least if she hasn't yeah thank you and then we have another question from christina i wonder could the immigrants take whatever surname they wanted when they came to america well again again going back to that myth uh so you could pick whatever name you wanted to but whatever name you gave when you came over that's on the manifest may it be that you left from Gothenburg, or you left from london or you left from uh, hamburg uh, whatever name was on the manifest that you gave when you came over is what is going to be your on your arrival into America. Now, you could have changed your name or, quote, Americanized your name, made it sound, you know, more shortened it or given an American uh, twist to it. Um, some people have a, a given name that may have not sounded like they were... Um, you know, an American and to try to kind of fit in, they may just say, oh, yes, instead of my name being Gregory uh, uh, Goldstein, I am now Gregory Gold. You know, I mean, that that sort of idea of sort of narrowing it down. So the, the change may be subtle. To completely change your name um, may imply a couple of things. One was your ancestor leaving and uh, that they have a past that they were trying to escape from. Uh, or did they just, again, want to sound more Americanized and pick their name? So hopefully you, um, the immigrant, if they change their surname, they probably uh, changed it for the reason, for the second reason, probably to have it to have a more Euro, uh, a more American, less uh, ethnic uh, sound to it. And, and nowadays, of course, you know, you can have whatever name you wanted to. But back then there was so much scrutiny against uh, immigrants. And applying for jobs and uh there were immigrant aid societies for pretty much every uh immigrant that was out there at the time that could have helped them when they arrived into america um but there was no reason to change your name that was really your own decision okay yeah uh, for example we know a lot of nilsson they changed the name to nelson because that sounds more mm -hmm. more Amer more more english or more american yeah, the um, there's a neighboring town um, to me. That's one town over actually, and they had a granite quarry, and they also had a uh, a shovel factory, and they asked for immigrants from uh, Sweden to come over, 
and they they're most of the families that were there if you look at the 1900 the 1920 census all the real workers and besides the people that lived in the community for hundreds of years uh they're all from sweden in fact i have cousins that intermarried with some of the families from there i have an uncle whose family went to springfield massachusetts and they were from sweden um, i have all of the original documents for them and again they were nielsen's but they became nelson and uh so that's again a typical thing that just happened you didn't need to i mean and by i would say by world war ii you're seeing less of those name changes it seems to be from uh prior to world war ii that you're finding more people more apt to want to change their name even my own last name uh, is irish uh lambert we came over in the 1790s and in the earliest records um my last name is as you can see is l-a-m-b-e-r-t I've seen it as L A M P A R D, L A M P P E, L A M P B E R T, because if you say with a brogue, Lambert and Lampert sound about the same, yeah. and so someone's hearing that and they're writing it down. So, and a lot of times we don't know if our ancestors changed their name or that nobody could get it correct anyway. So that's why they wrote it down differently. So have some creativity, and thank goodness for Soundex. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so we got a, a question here from Thomas that says, David's wife had an ancestor from Borås. Did he mean Borås or a parish near Borås? I guess he's in the area. <laughs> ah, uh, no, they actually came from Borås. Uh, that's, that, that's where she was born in 1874, Amanda Christiana Hendrik's daughter. Um, and he was Andres Johan Hendrik's son, and he was the son of Hendrik Arvidsson. And I know that what threw me initially when I was very early doing the research, that in the census I found that he was a soldat and his name was Anders Johan Nyberg. And I said, that sounds like a Jewish surname. And then I didn't realize the whole way you took the name of the farm that you were the soldat for. So understanding that was like this great like understanding of why the surnames had changed. But yeah, they're from Boros. Uh, one of these days we'd like to go there. We have... Um, Never found any DNA matches uh, with her cousins in Sweden. Of course, you know, surnames being changed so much. Uh, but not, nothing on that family has ever come up as a DNA match. So I need somebody in Burroughs to go door to door with a DNA <laughs> kit till we find a cousin. So if you know anybody, Thomas, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, we actually, we actually had, uh, every year we have a, a big uh, genealogy event and it's in different places uh, every year and last year it was actually in the Borås and I think there were a lot of people doing DNA tests because you can always test you there but most people in Sweden test with family tree DNA. Well my fingers are crossed yeah <laughs> it would be nice to find some cousins over in the old country. <laughs> yeah so Let's see, I haven't had time to read this, but I put it up and it's from Maria. I have a Swedish man that emigrated to the US in the 1880s. I very well know who he was in the US and his American name. He moved to Alaska later on. The problem is that I don't know who he is in Sweden. I wouldn't hear where he came from. I don't know exactly when he emigrated and how old he was. Any ideas on how I can try to find him back in time and find him? Ooh. I'm sorry to hear that he was killed by two Norwegians in Alaska. Yeah. Is I would imagine, uh, Maria, that he was probably going up there during the great Alaska gold rush. Um, there was so much adventurers that went up there. That's, and unfortunately, so many people did, uh, unfortunately, come across uh, to be murdered or robbed and whatnot. So there's probably a, quite a story behind that. If he became a naturalized United States citizen, there should be um, perhaps um, in Alaska or wherever he had settled before he went to Alaska, I would look at Ancestry.com and Fold3.com to see if there's a naturalization petition um, because that would say that he's giving up his allegiance to the King of Sweden and it might say the village where he came from. Um, one of the problems is that Immigrants didn't really have a lot of need to actually record exactly where they came from. So, like, for instance, if you looked at him, uh, if he lived until the 1900 census, for instance, the 1890s gone, um, it may just say Sweden. It shouldn't actually. If it said anything else, I'd be very surprised. But what it would also ask you is what country your mother or father is from. So, if, for instance, 
his mother was from Norway or if he, his father was not from Sweden or something like that, you might find that change. The other thing is if you know his occupation, the census is going to help you narrow down that. And that occupation is often listed with when he arrived on his naturalization. So I would try Ancestry.com and Fold3 because that would probably be the way you would be able to connect back in Sweden. And the other thing, as like Linda and I were talking about, DNA. Um, maybe you'll find a DNA match and at least will put you in that region of Sweden, even if the surname because of patronymics is different. Yeah, uh, and she wrote a comment here. He he wasn't killed. He killed two Norwegians. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was sorry. the murderer. Oh gosh. Well, then 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 in that case, uh, that's what I get for having a different pair of glasses on today. Um, there may be an arrest record. There may be uh, records if you contact the Alaska uh, State Archives. He may have gone to prison, and there may be some paperwork on that that might say where he actually came from so that that even makes it a, a little bit better i'm sorry i read that that he was killed by two norwegians so yeah. But yeah that's great yeah but but that that's so often thing as well we we think that if we don't find it online that it doesn't exist but there are so many records that are offline that's very and, true. And and contact and contacting state archives or other archives, they can provide more information. That's very true. I mean, it's because the budgets of archives may it be you know, in Sweden or you know over in America. You know, they only have so much money to commit to digitization. And as we know, with a lot of things, even with Family Search, there's a lot of records online you can browse, but they're not all indexed yet. So. Um, I, like when people tell me their genealogy is completely done, I like to say, great, you can do mine next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think we're going to take the, the question from uh, the guest last week, and I will play it for you so you will hear what it was. And uh, in English, it is, uh, I love these stories that we can find. Uh, when we do genealogy. So what is your most exciting story in your own genealogy? My most exciting story. Well, I started doing my wife's genealogy. We've been uh, married now almost uh, going on 32 years. And when we uh, were teenagers, I started to look at her family tree and to find out that her great, great grandfather was living on the same street as my great great grandfather about the distance of probably five cars away from each other and they were both uh, in the teamster job so they would of course had wagons and horses i'm just sure that they had to have bumped into each other at some point in time or maybe literally um the best discovery Again, this goes on my uh, wife's side of the tree. I live in Stoughton, Massachusetts, and probably about a half a mile from where I live is an old colonial cemetery. It dates back to the 1740s. And as a kid, I was always going around writing down the gravestones. At one point, I audio recorded what was on the stones. I did grave rubbings when I probably shouldn't have done grave rubbings. But I remember two Revolutionary War soldiers. Uh, Abraham and Jonathan Jordan, they had Revolutionary War gravestones. And I was always intrigued, wow, did they die during the war? Well, when I did my wife's genealogy, her family comes from Nova Scotia, Canada. They arrived in Massachusetts in the 1850s. When they arrived in Nova Scotia, they were planters. They showed up there after the expulsion of the Acadians um, by the British. Uh, there was land to be settled, so they came in from Connecticut. Before they came from Connecticut, they lived in Stoughton, Massachusetts, a half a mile and across the street from where we live now. So my daughters have gone from 1732, living right nearby, to full circle all the way out of America and back in again, and living down the street from where their ancestor lived. In fact, the best man from my wedding, his house was on the site of her ancestor's house from the 1700s. So. That was my most, um, I should say, uh, serendipitous or psychic roots, as Hank Jones would say, uh, experience with genealogy, the yeah, best yeah. discovery. Yeah, I think I think those kind of things happens a lot when you when you do genealogy. 
Yeah. There's a lot of full circle. Uh, I mean, it's just like aha moments. I mean, I love it when I can walk into an old cemetery and I'm wandering around trying to figure out where the gravestone is and I find it in a short amount of time. That's always great. Uh, yeah. I always say that somebody's giving me the direction. <laughs> exactly. We, we uh, bought this house 10 years ago and uh, I, of course, looked into who had lived in the house before. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that my, my, my boyfriend, one of his older relatives had lived in this exactly house and died of tuberculosis. Oh, like wow. in, in, in the, in when the, the house was quite new. So, wow. Yeah. That's what are yeah. the odds for that. It, yeah, no, it's it's strange when you can find those connections. I did the genealogy of the house history of mine. My house was built in 1897, and I got a phone call at li the library one time where someone was asking about a doctor in Stoughton, Massachusetts. And I said, oh, I said, well, I can answer that question. I'm the town historian. Who are you looking for? And they said, oh, Dr. Charles Gray. And I said, you better sit down. I told the guy on the phone. And he goes, why? Because I said, I own his house. And he goes, well, that was my grandfather. And I said, I better sit down. I said, I don't think he, I knew he had any kids. And apparently this doctor had uh, been married, couldn't get a divorce, had two children with his nurse back before World War I, kidnapped the children, was ruined and moved out of Boston and moved here to Stoughton into my home. The funny thing is where I work in Boston is around the corner from where his office was in World War before World War One, so it's very very strange. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small world. It very much is, very much is. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you about uh, a special tool you like or an app that you use in your uh, own genealogy. What's your favorite? <sighs> when I am able to get the DNA. Uh, downloaded off of Ancestry or whatever companies use. And I, I, I love GEDmatch. Um, it's really allowed me to kind of look at um, the matches and kind of pair them out. But I must say the one that is really my favorite is uh, Johnny Cerny's DNA Painter because I'm able to see right down to the segments. Uh, and for a kid that was not really that excited about science, I really wish I learned a little bit more back in high school and in college on uh, biology and genetics and all that. But it's it fascinates me. Um, and of course, you know, having the capability of this being my camera, my transcriber, my recorder, uh, my journal, um, it really is amazing. The one thing that I have been doing since we have been closed um, is to try to create a tool from my descendants to learn what's going on. And I could, of course, you know, take pictures, but how many of us print out of all of our pictures? I kept a journal. I bought a regular journal and I just wrote down every day what's going on in Massachusetts or in the world in my life and hopefully tuck that away someplace. So in a hundred years, one of my descendants or someone will find it and find it interesting. So that's the best tool that you can leave for your descendants is to leave your story. What, whatever yeah. way you do it. Yeah, that, that that's uh, that's something to think about. Yeah, yeah, it's it's because we we're in our dash right now, you know. So we might as well leave a record. If you stop and think of how many records that we actually leave as a person, no matter what country you live in, you know, a birth record, a marriage record, a divorce record, a, you know, obviously me and ultimately a death record, maybe a probate, court records, your school records. And could all of those fit into one box and what will actually be left after we're gone? So giving our own, you know, stories or recording things down is so important, especially even if you just print off the photos in your camera once in a while, uh, it's, it's a valuable tool. Yeah. Uh, and now another question is Ashley Lambert related to you. I don't know who Ashley Lambert is. Ashley Lambert. Well, my Lamberts are a little, unfortunately, Lambert is about the 56th most common name uh, out there. And it basically means one who is from the bright land. In fact, the, the DNA part of things are really fascinating, just to throw this on the side. So um, my people are from Ireland. I don't know before 1793 where exactly. I have a couple of DNA matches. My Y DNA haplogroup 
is I2A asterisk Western. And I have a SNP L233, which is only found in Germany. So here's my thought. 35,000 years ago, my DNA is reported to be in Bosnia. So I like to call myself a Bosnian German Anglo-Saxon who invades England, England invades Ireland, English, Irish, Canadian, American. So I am a Bosnian German Anglo-Saxon uh, English, Irish, Canadian, American who became a dual citizen with Canada. And in America right now, there are only two members of my family, the male Lamberts, that are the same. So there's Miranda Lambert, there's Adam Lambert, uh, you know, the person who sings for Queen. None of them are my distant cousins or even far distant cousins. But if they want to, you know, be in touch and invite me to a party or a concert or something like that, I'm right there with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I also used to, to ask my guests because we usually know uh, people in, in the genealogy field. We know what they what they do in, in, in terms of genealogy. But tell us something that most people don't know about you. Something they don't know about me. Um, I'm an actor. I do, yes. So um, <clears throat> when I'm not on stage doing Journey All the Day, I like to play Smee and Peter Pan. Or I could play Bob Cratchit in the pit and, and Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, if you can just a little bit more call. Or I can sing and dance on stage when I want to with an American or whatever accent I choose to butcher. Um, I love acting. Um, it's something my daughter got me uh, into. I was very, I should say, not shy, but an extrovert that just never got on stage. Um, so I love doing plays. I love doing theater. Um, and the other thing is I am an avid baseball historian uh, and autograph collector. I've been uh, fascinated by the sport of baseball and baseball player history since I was a kid. I was actually able to locate the oldest living professional baseball player. If you go to Wikipedia and look up Silas Simmons, he lived to be 111 years old. He was with the former Negro Leagues. And I was given a list from a uh, researcher, uh, Larry Lester. And he said, could you track down these baseball players? You're a genealogist. We don't know what happened to them. Well, I found the guy alive at 107, 108. Wow. And I called the nursing home and I said, is he still... Um, coherent to have a conversation with she goes, she hopes so. He's still here clipping things out of the newspaper and putting in folders because he wants to know about it. He outlived all of his children and his grandchildren are in their 60s and 70s. When I met him, when he turned 111 years old and I gave him a big hug and he goes, thank you for finding me. They had a big party for him. He was in Sports Illustrated magazine. And his, the idea was, how did, you know, I didn't think anybody cared about me. I said, Sai, I said, problem is that no one's alive that could have saw you play baseball 90 something <laughs> years ago it was kind of like finding a 747 in 1917 it shouldn't existed and let alone a baseball player who played baseball in like 1912 in 2006 so that that is awesome that so was what, what, yeah what's what's your favorite baseball team uh the boston red sox of yeah, course. Live and die by the Red Sox. My father lived 74 <laughs> years and never saw them win a World Series once. And I've lived uh, 50 years and I've seen them win four times. So I suppose I'm, I've am i I've had my quota, but I'm still waiting for one more time. <laughs> <laughs> one more time, yeah. Yeah, baseball isn't big in Sweden, so. No, I know. No? But, you know, uh, it's it's something that, you know, it it could catch on. I mean, they, they had it over in uh, – in England, and uh, we, our largest rivalry is the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. It's been the case since day one. And um, they went to London, England uh, a year ago and basically got clobbered by the Yankees. And I said, they don't even have to leave America to get clobbered by the Yankees. They had to go all the way over to England and then lose faith right there. I'm like, oh, no. So I, I watched it after a couple hours, and I just shut it off, you know. So, but yeah, no, baseball and acting, that's probably my, uh, my two favorite other loves. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, and uh, I want you to pass on a question for the next guest. Sure. Next week. Okay. And I think it might, I think it will be someone in the field of doing forensic uh, genealogy, helping uh, law enforcement solve 
crime. Yeah. So if you want to uh, question on that topic or whatever question you want. So. I think I could put a spin and make it a two part and they can answer it either way. All right. So my question to you, if you could pick somebody you've researched that's no longer here, that by talking to them would solve the problem of what you're researching, who would it be and why? And if you could pick an ancestor in your own genealogy that you never met, who would you talk to and what would you ask them? That would be my question for you. Great questions. So I think that was everything. We've been talking for an hour, an hour past fast when we're having fun, right? It really is. And Linda, I am so pleased to be a guest. And if you make a recording of this and it's uh, out there, I will be more than happy to share it with my followers. Uh, and if they want to reach me, I'm DL Genealogist on Twitter. Um, that's where I usually reside. I use Facebook every so often, but Twitter is my home base. And uh, Linda and I, I think that we've been Twitter friends for four years. Yeah. So happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you to everyone that's been watching and uh, asked questions. And everyone had thanks for a great hour. Thank you. So uh, I will put on this uh, outro song that I put together. Uh, it's uh, my grandmother who, who sings. So. Uh, until next week, have a nice day and thank you for watching. And thank you so much, David, for, for being my guest. The pleasure was all mine. And I'll be glad to come back anytime you want me again, Linda. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Vad gör det att solen går neder Då den kommer i morgon igen?